David Pedora from Farm Business Consultants in Calgary. Uh -huh. A bit about background on David. He's a graduate of the Business Administration with a major in accounting from Red, Deer, no, Red River College in Winnipeg. Shortly after graduating, uh, David moved to Calgary and worked with Edward Gaston, Nova, and Albert Corporation as an accountant. Later, he would, would work with Saltran Limited, a sulfur transportation company as their senior accountant. You must like numbers, hey? Yeah, but I hate accounting. Uh, <laughs> in more recent years, he became an entrepreneur with business dealings involved with marketing and intellectual property, as well as owning and operating a grocery store and produce store in rural Saskatchewan. Now he works with farm business consultants as a business development manager. Welcome, David. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, <clears throat> for having us. We, we really do appreciate the opportunity. And this, this, to me, is a great turnout. This is phenomenal. I mean, just so happy about that. Um, just a little quick little sidebar, and we'll just leave it as anonymous. But I know of at least two members of FBC in this room right now. Um, Oh, let me get this. So again, tax tips for new business. It, it probably should be more of tax tips just for business. Because again, whether it's new or not, all these um, tips and things are, are very applicable. And as well, we have a similar presentation that's for the farming community because again actually we got our roots in the farming community um, we're across the country except for Quebec and so everyone seems to sort of just skip over Quebec um, we have uh, over 300 tax specialists that work in our full uh, we're working with over 20,000 small businesses and um, we've been in uh, been in existence since 1965 that's uh, in 1965 years since 1952 and in 1952 was the first year that I'm trying to <laughs> 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 okay. is 1952 was the first year that the um, government said that farmers actually had to file a tax return company FBC is the same family it's uh, third or fourth generation. We'll just say back in 1952, Grandpa went to his neighbors and said, I'm good with numbers and I don't mind doing paperwork. Do you want me to do it for you? That's how the company got started in 1952. It has evolved to where we are now. Um, and again, as nice thing is, is it's still privately held same family. <coughs> now, some keys for, for uh, businesses. And uh, I was talking to, uh, to, to somebody earlier today, and it was about if you're going to set up a business, you really want to try to set it up right the first time. Because again, it just creates, if anybody's ever set up a business and gone, oh shoot, wish I had done this or didn't quite think around that corner. Choosing the right structure is very important for continuing on your longevity. May seem simple, but good record keeping can't say enough about good record keeping because CRA just can get all miserable even if you've just got bad record keeping. So it's about uh, benefits and tips of it, when to register for your GST and uh, vehicle logs are topics that we'll be touching on. Tax tips we'll be talking about the owners and avoiding how to avoid the audit and what to do in the case of. Now here's Pretty much these are your three uh, 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 choices for uh, picking. It's either a sole proprietor, which is basically yourself. There's a partnership, which has to be set up pro you know, as a partnership, where you're filing as a partnership, which would be just like two of you getting together and creating a company. And then, of course, the incorporation, which is, and people don't necessarily know, but it, an incorporation is a living, eating, breathing entity which has to file turn returns every year. It has to be have a birth and it has to have a death. If you're going to close out a company, you literally have to 
in theory, have a funeral for your, your company. So it's eating, breathing, just like you or I. Now, getting over to the sole proprietorship, the advantages. Literally, you could just walk out of here and going, I'm going to set up ABC computers. Well, you just set up a sole proprietor. That's that simple. So the startup costs are very low. Uh, ownership is your own. You own everything in it. Um, there's fewer government regulations over the whole process. And you only file one tax return. So you're, you're, you're sole proprietor, your business and yourself are filed under the same return. The disadvantages is liability is all yours. There's no corporate veil. There's all of that. It has a limited life in that it's limited to as long as you're alive. Because it is you. It's not its own entity. And increased difficulty in raising capital. If you've ever started up a small business, you know that probably the biggest problem in it all at the beginning is trying to find out where am I going to get some money. As nobody wants to look at you, and if they want to look at you, everything is, you know, you got to basically sign over the farm to them or they're not going to look at you. Now over to the partnership. <coughs> Advantages. So you can sharing your strengths. So again, you got two heads are better than one. You're both a part of the business. They're easy to form. It's more, there is some paperwork involved in actually establishing a uh, partnership, but it is very simple. Fewer regulations. Um, you have twice as good a chance of finding money because, again, they're going to be looking at the company, but then they're also going to be looking at the strength of the people. And if there's two of you, then the banks are going to be a little more favorable if you've got two people versus one. And... Uh, the partners file individual uh, tax returns and it's still at individual rates. The disadvantages are unlimited liability once again, limited life once again, and probably that's the biggest disadvantage here is the possibility of disputes. You know, it's, you get into an argument and then you start having to dissolve the partnership just to keep it going. So. I'll take my hat off for a second. This one's not my favorite. <laughs> now the incorporation, the advantages. Limited liability. You do have somewhat of a corporate veil to hide behind. It's not what it once was, you know, 30 years ago when it was... But there certainly is definitely benefits because of limited liability. The life can go on in perpetuity. So there's nothing to say that... Uh, like in a, in a sole proprietorship, you die, the business dies. Partnership, the, you know, it's, you're going to have to recreate a new partnership if you're in a partnership. This one, it doesn't matter because you're a shareholder and it's eating and breathing itself. You have good income control over your, because of the, the flex, additional flexibility that you do get. You can defer your taxes as well as income splitting. So you can place your income in, in where it could be most appropriate. Uh, case in point, if you've got, uh, you've, got, you've got a corporation and you've got two children, <coughs> one of them's going to college and one of them isn't, and you want to pay for it, but you want to pay through, you know, minimal amount of tax. Y your structure is, dad has 50 or 40 percent in shares class A, mom has 40 percent class B, one son, one son has 5 percent of C, and the other one has 5% of D. So when it comes time to pay the tuition in that, you the corporation declares a dividend for the son that's going to college, class B, C, and he gets all the dividend, nobody gets anything. It's because you set it up as four different sh class structures. If they were all class A, then everybody has to be handled equally. Then if you gave one person, everybody would have to get their appropriate portion. So you'd have to, that's where, but that's an example of being able to uh, split up your income uh, via the corporation. You have small business tax deductions. Um, business, even if it's just that you're a corporation. And your name is protected. So there's potentially goodwill in, of that nature that's being evolved because you can sell the name. Disadvantages, 
there certainly are startup costs, whether, you, I mean, you can do them yourself, or lots of times lawyers will have shelf companies that you just go in there and you buy a company off their shelf, get their minute book. It's a second tax return that needs to be filed because the corporation has to file a return every year as well as yourself. There's certainly increased paperwork uh, overseeing, because um, you have to also file a, um, your annual report, I can't think of the annual, there's, there's a tax return, then there's your annual return, which is just updating to the uh, registries about uh, share structure and that nature and who's involved. Um, you don't get the same personal tax credit. It is less flexible in your ability because it is bigger and com a little bit more cumbersome. Liability may not be completely limited, and that's what I was sort of touching on earlier, where like 30 years ago, the corporate veil was very strong and people hid behind it. And they've been bringing down those walls. And closing it out is more difficult because again, it's not just shut it down. You have to shut it down, then you have to make file reports, and you have to close out the company. So there is more involved with it. When to incorporate. This is a, is a question that, I mean, we are getting asked all the time, you know, like, when, when do I come into that point? And when's that threshold to make it make it make sense. Well, when you're generating profits in excess of personal spending requirements. So at the end of the day, your retained earnings or you know, your potentially the money in the 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 company is going up, then you can just roll that into to retained earnings if it was incorporated versus just leaving it there. Um, when there is an opportunity to reinvest large portions of ca uh, into capital expansion, again, taking this money and making more with it, and it's just staying within the corporation, which is, again, giving you all that corporate advantages there. Uh, when debt servicing of the business demands a large portion of the profits, um, this would be... Uh, yeah, it's just because you're getting yourself to a point and you're, you're, you're in investing or getting money or borrowing money for expansion into different things. Um, again, because of the nature of it, instead of it all being all personal debt, this is when you want to, you know, you want to get your debt and do it in the corporate side of the things if you can. That's, so what you want to do is you want to move it, instead of moving this debt from, into personal, you want to put it over into the corporation. And again, that's freeing up yourself for being your flexibility to do it yourself. So when these debt servicing demands a large portion of the profits, it might be time to consider. Um, when you desire greater flexibility upon the closure of the business. Um, when you're trying to shut down the business, and we talk about this, and you know, as a business, if you're we talk about with farm the, the farming community about this. Um, they want to start divesting themselves from the farm. They've been on the farm for 40 years and it's now time to move on. It's again, in the corporation, there's ways that you can set it through shares and the likes of that, that it's easier to shut down the business and to be able to maintain that, those, um, the assets to you know, children or, you know, spouse, however you want to, to divvy it up. Um, but you're getting, um, you have much more flexibility on how it looks like when you're trying to shut the, them down. And um, when you require greater flexibility or more options when transferring the business. Again, you can change from closure to transferring. It's the same principles, just giving you the more of the flexibility because you're not selling, you're selling shares in a company. If you, you know, if you were going to do this through the incorporation, you're selling the company, you're selling the shares or a number of the shares. <coughs> Here's what we're talking about, good record keeping. CRA can fi fine you if they determine that you've got uh, bad record keeping. If you come up and they go, that, they can actually fine you for that. Um, but good records will help you keep the money that is owed to you and get you back to work sooner in the event of an audit. Um, in a tax assessment, CRA is right until you, you prove them wrong. It's again, their, their adage is you're guilty until proven innocent. Again, good record keeping will save time in your filings. Again, just your own organizational things. 
it can really help and I really strongly suggest this to uh, young people that are starting up we supply them uh, the member if they want to with a so access to a software accounting software package and I tell the young ones I say if you're gonna do anything try it for six months because the best way you're gonna learn about your business is by doing the books you're gonna see what's going on with your business by doing the book so do it for six months fail miserably but at least you're gonna have learned so much more about your business and if you hate it you hate it that's fine but take the time to try to learn because it's a good just like getting set up with your structure getting to understand what's really going on within the business is critical um, again by that is you, know, you see trends and flow ebbs and flows of, of what's going on within the business um, good record keeping you are going to get someone comes in with a beautiful set of books and things like that or someone comes in with a box you know you're going to look at them both but you're going to think well this guy that's got organized he's you know the best predictor of the future is the past so he did a good job here so I'm going to assume that he's doing a good job going forward greater awareness of what you're spending your money on it will give you a better clearer picture of the whole financial health and in the event of an audit you're not scrambling to get yourself prepared for it minimum records they six years they say seven years it's six years and then because it's ultimately seven years um, paper ledger electro, electronic bookkeeping software again our members can have that provided to them at no charge you're doing it yourself and that's what I suggest initially um, printed or digital copy of receipts and inclusive of supporting documentation so it's again making sure that if you've got these expenses you're able to prove that these are expenses because you've got your either electronic or digital any supporting documentation of that uh, example of that would be <coughs> your daughter's in a volleyball tournament at school and so what they're going to do is they have the brochure or program and they want to see you can buy a, a, a little square on the program for fifty dollars well that's not a charitable donation because the school's not a charity but what it is is it's a promotional item that can be written off as long as you've got the receipt and keep the copy of the program because it's actually got the program on uh, with your card on it so keep that keep that that's a very valid ex expense but it's not a charitable donation now <coughs> for GST you must register for GST if both apply you provide taxable supplies in Canada and you are not a small supplier now a small supplier is that your sales are under 30,000 that's the threshold so if you've got over 30,000 you need to file a return it may only need to be annually um, you know at that level but you would need to uh, you may voluntarily register and once the threshold is met you are no longer a small supplier in the following years so if you have a good year and you do 50,000 and you register and then you decide you're only going to do things part-time and you're down to 20,000 you're still considered a small supplier and uh, are not a, not a small supplier anymore and you have to continue to file your uh, GST return CRA can allow auto expenses without a log I personally don't keep a log and I probably should but I don't but um, Full log is each business trip destination reason and distance covered and a full a log for a sample period full month for 12 12 months at least one three continuous periods same period within this full year same three months then this is interesting because it's how many households and you need to be careful of this in the event of an audit because if some if an auditor comes to see you they uh, and you've got your vehicles all decked out with uh, Expedia cruise lines all over the truck and uh, and the auditor comes up and goes okay okay so you say here that you've got uh, you're using that truck for hundred percent a business because that's all you do and the guy goes okay great well that wait you know, that's a beautiful boat you've got out back I love that boat where are you where do you take it to oh we go to Sylvan oh, okay would you be uh, taking it there with the hitch that's on the back of your truck 
you know, that's what they're going to look for. So what we do in those scenarios, and I mean, we would do it right up the front. We'd say, no, no, no. We'll do 90%. And you know that, your little Honda Civic? We'll do 10% on the Honda Civic. You know, close enough that everyone's happy, but we're not raving red, fl red flags over your head by saying it's 100%, because they immediately want to go to the BS button. Um, yeah. So anyway, that's an example again. And again, I'm sort of jumping around a little bit, but that's a prime example of if you get, if you get audited or they're going to say they're going to come and audit you, you know, whether it's us or whether have somebody there with you that's an accountant that has dealt with CRA so they know what they're doing. Because you're inevitably going to shoot yourself in the foot somehow. With, you're going to do say something that's just going to trigger them to go into something else. So having, I used to do mortgages for a lot of years. And I tell you, realtors did not want their customers talking directly to the bank. Because they're going to say things that they, they don't, you know, the customer's going to say not necessarily the right things. So they'd always want everything buffered through the mortgage broker. Same is true here. You want to have somebody there that can, knows what to say to CRA if, if you're in, in that area. If they're uh, coming after you. Understanding laws. Can, can he, the uh, Tax Act is about that thick. It's only a small book. But I guarantee you, I think those pages in that book are thinner than the ones in the Bible. They are just, it's just a thousand, it weighs like five pounds or something like that. And by the time it actually gets published, it's quite literally outdated by the time it's published. It, because of the changes that are constantly ongoing. Published semi before it's printed. The Tax Act, according to the government, they call it in black, white, and gray. Black is illegal, okay? So we're not even just going to talk about that. But then they say white and gray. That 20% they say is white, and 80% of it is gray. So 80% of the act is subject to interpretation. It's only subject to interpretation until they decide what that subject to interpretation means, and then, it's, then it all goes to fact. And that's where it comes back. It goes back to fact. They tell you you're wrong. Then you have to prove that you're right. And that is a little bit of a misnomer because eighty percent until they decide it's, until they decide it isn't. Another thing. Did you know that a the CRA can be the people acceptable tolerance for error is fifteen percent. So the person that's going over your taxes and that. They're okay with being 15% wrong. Seems like a high number to me, but anyway. I think if I was wrong 15% of the time, I'd probably be unemployed. <laughs> Simple as it seems, file on time, file on time. It seems ridiculous, it seems, but lots of people are in just because they just don't bother. And it's not like it's difficult. It's not like it should come as a surprise. Timing your capital gains and losses to reduce your tax burden. Do you want to take a look at your, you, before your year end, you want to see where you're at. Where are you at in the process? So do we need to, we've had a good year, so we want to get find some more expenses somewhere? Or we had a, sort of a poor year and we're going to think about, we're going to try to defer those taxes maybe to next year where it would be more appropriate the following year. Time these things so that it works for you. Use it to your benefit as best you can. As a part of our service, I, I, we offer uh, what we call as an early tax call. And I'm going to go so far to say as I'm not sure anybody's probably heard of that, but an early tax call is I'll just say you're all just sole proprietors and your year ends December 31. We would say probably in September, maybe October, we're going to come out, we're going to do a full-on tax return for you at this point in time, at this moment. So you know exactly where you are right now because if we wait till December 31st, your options are RRSPs or RRSPs. But if we know in September, October, November that maybe we can do some things, 
to again reduce the tax burden to adjust yourself accordingly. That service is a la carte, but that is definitely a service we offer, and it's a, it's a service that I do promote. Keep business and personal finances separate. Very, very important, but very easily done. Just make sure, and it doesn't, if you've got a business, it does, the credit card does not have to be in the business name, but the, the credit card have it so that one is for the business and one is for personal. The one for business, you know, it's because if you had carry a balance ever, you can write off the expense, the interest. Your, your membership fee, your annual fees, if, you, if it's just purely for business, you can write off those fees. If you've got blended transactions in there, they're just going to go forget it. We don't want to see it. So that interest, that other stuff, so you keep them completely separate from each other and it just makes things really easy. The other thing is if you get a points card, get a points card because you don't get taxed on points, you get taxed on cash. So if it's a cash card, you could end up with some tax. Um, am I sort of running out of... Okay, let's blow through this. Mortgage interest deductible, get a HELOC, use your HELOC to use your investment. That interest can be if it's all used up strictly for that. Um, getting the facts before you rent out a portion of your home. People that rent out their basements, if they try to... You can, you can depreciate the house, we just strongly against it because then when you come to sell the house, then you've got a capital gains. Uh, don't overlook the lesser known deductions. Pay yourself a salary. The minimum, if you're, you gotta, if you're incorporated, you've got to pay yourself a salary up to the minimum deduction. That 11800 and uh, And then I've discussed that. That was that thing about the volleyball tournament and that. Avoiding an audit. Um, 30% of small businesses have been audited in the last three years, uh, resulting in uh, 61 hours, 10 days of lost time, and not filing your taxes on time is, is a big trigger. They just like to get there in the business to collect money, so they want to just continue to do such. File a return with errors. Sometimes people, what they'll do is they'll file a return, just put down numbers that are not even reasonably close, they like the idea that you filed on time, they just don't like that you put in a bunch of bogus numbers. So they can get, can get yourself, so it's, don't just throw one in just for the sake of being able to say you filed on time. They're going to ask for information, just provide it for them. Always claiming a loss, well again, they're in the business to collect money, not, uh, uh, not just have you pay you back money. High expenses, limited income, these are fairly straightforward. These can be overlooked with Again, because you get into trends with the oil patch. And that, lots of people, a lot of businesses have high expenses because they're still trying to make money and they've got limited income. That's explainable. If you're in a business where everybody's booming and you're, you're at the other end of the spectrum, that's a, that's a flag to be waved. Again, differences in revenues. If everybody's making lots and you're claiming losses, if CRA does get in touch with you, Notify the people around you because they will spider things out to the people around you. Um, you need to be in touch with them about making arrangements. Um, if they come into you, don't be overly helpful, but be helpful enough to make sure that, because again, they are just somebody that's actually just doing a job. I'm not sure how to pick the job, but that's somebody picking the, the job. Be honest, be open. Again, it just, you just start getting belligerent with them. They to start to look, dig, dif dig differently. And very quickly, our, our uh, four models, the preparation, we will, uh, we have uh, our own proprietary software. CRA wanted to buy it off us and we said no. Um, The cons consulting, again, going through all the various decisions that may be made. We'll be looking at that all with, through a tax perspective with you. And the audit protection is that we will defend you all the way to the Tax Court of Canada, if required. Um, 
The last time we did that was a few years ago. It was a farmer in Saskatchewan. It was over a $50,000 equipment. He had a big operation. CRA said no. We said yes. They said no. We said we're going to challenge you. They said, because typically at that point they go, okay, you're FBC. We'll just let you run along. 500 bucks. Don't tell anybody. But they didn't. So we fought them. We took them to court. It cost us probably in excess of $30,000. We won. So we rewrote, there was that aspect of the tax act was updated. But we took that, so we had a very happy farmer, but then we took that and put it into our software and we put that out to our farmers the next year. $3.2 million we saved them on that one tax challenge. So that's why we do it. Sorry, it took so long.